Welcome to the Pursuing Uncomfortable podcast. How are you today? I'm good, thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Melissa. Yeah, it's my pleasure. It's going to be a fun interview today. So I'm really excited to to get into what you do and how you do it. So let's just jump right in, shall we? Great, sounds good. So tell us, tell us about yourself. Tell us what you do about your books. So I'm from Melbourne, Australia. Um, I've lived here my whole life. Uh, I started writing, so I got my first book publishing deal in 2018. And I write romance books. So the first book is an enemies to lovers type trope um, called Law and Disorder. And then I have two books out that's part of the same series called Etched in Stone and Stepping Stone. And they're both based in an investment firm. So they have financial crime elements. It sounds really exciting, and I've already put them in my cart on Amazon. I can't wait to get them and Thank you. read through them. No, Thank you. this was a, an inspired work for you, was it not? <clears throat> yeah, so with Stepping Stone, the main male character, he has uh, PTSD from serving in the war, and I got inspiration because I've got anxiety, and I know it's not the same thing as PTSD from serving in the war, but some of the symptoms or um, the physical signs are similar, like the chest constricting and um, being startled easily by loud noises. So I used my experience with those to bring into the character. And also I have a friend that served in Afghanistan. Um, when So he said pretty much all soldiers that come back from the war, they experience some form of PTSD. So he gave me good insight on that. And, um, and because of my experiences with anxiety and also with men's mental health, I think men are less likely to seek help compared to women because they might be a bit embarrassed to, um, speak out about any vulnerabilities. Um, a portion of Stepping Stones Prophets is going to, um, I always get this name wrong because it's a very long name, but it's Anxiety and Depression Association of America. All right. Well, that's good to know. I'm already intrigued. So has writing been an outlet for you and dealing with understanding and coping with your symptoms and with your anxiety? Mm. Yeah, definitely. Um, So I am on Lovan, which is on a low dosage anxiety medication. Um, So it used to be when, since I was young, and even when I started work, that I would be awake until all hours of the night worrying about silly things like if someone's mad at me or until the alarm came off. And um, and so I would get zero sleep that night. So that's why I started taking low van to be able to go to sleep that night. But other than that, I didn't really find it reduce those symptoms that much, those d- day-to-day symptoms. So then um, I, I found writing is better than therapy. I've been to go- cognitive behavior therapy, which um, which, which honestly, I, I didn't don't really think it really helped me that much, but I know it's helped a lot of people. So I don't dis- dis- disregard that, but, um, but I think it's important to find something that best suits you and your needs and maybe something that I resonated with. So writing helped me escape to another world, thinking about fictional characters in a make-believe world. That sounds exciting. So how many books? You said you had three in the series. Is that correct? There'll be three in the series. So in the Invested in You series, I'm working on the third book at the moment. And each book is based on a different female um, team member in an IT and data analytics team. So I wanted to write um, female female characters that based in a team that's usually maybe male dominated and to maybe explore that avenue and um my friends have been a great help so one of my friends that works in the it he's given me insight of what hacking might look like and what coding might look like it went over my head but um it was good to learn something new (laughs) 
Yeah, I bet you learn a whole lot by doing these characters and writing these books. Yeah, and to be able to picture like totally different people, so that really helps with with my anxiety, along with other things as well. Um, um, about I think early last year I started um doing the Wim Hof method. So I'm not sure if your listeners have heard of him, but he's a guy from Iceland and um he he practices cold therapy and with the 10 week program um what he does is is a combination of breathing exercises and meditation um plus it's also cold water therapy so it's building up the cold showers every week so it will start off from maybe 15 to 30 seconds to at the end I was doing 10 minutes of cold showers and while I was in that cold shower all dresses just fly out the window because I just think I can't wait to get out of this cold shower. <laughs> it seems so counterintuitive because when I think of comfort, I think of a nice long hot shower, <laughs> not in a frigid cold shower that I want to escape from. <laughs> yeah, I, I think the point is to like to push myself um, physically and because realistically a 10, 15 second shower, it won't harm me, but it's more controlling the mind, I think. Um, so controlling the physical body and then so that my mind will obey. <laughs> Do you come out of that experience with a better understanding that your mind is the boss, that your mind gets yeah. to be in charge and you can assert your thoughts to control other sensations in your body? Yeah, I, I think that's defi definitely the case um, because I think part of, having anxiety, my mind isn't always the boss. Like it does spiral out of control to really ridiculous scenarios that most people will think will never happen. And, um, and I think pushing myself physically, it does, it does link with the mind. So, um, so I've been trying to push myself physically with other things as well. Like, um, I do 20 hour fastings for a few times a week and at first when I started doing it I used to get really cranky towards the ends but um but I've gotten used to it so it's all about training the, the mind so that when things happen um I I'll be able to more equipped to handle it that makes a lot of sense to me that in <laughs> trying these things and of course one should always be careful and edge into these things not just plunge into them yeah, but, that's true. Yeah, when we do these things, it reminds us that we are the boss of our thoughts. We get to choose what we think, and we can assert some control over our experience. And that gets lost when we're in the grips of anxiety, that we can <laughs> control. But it's not just a switch we flip, it's a muscle that we train and an instinct yeah. that we develop. Okay. Yeah, I, I think it's a big thing, um, like, when I started jujitsu a few weeks ago, um, so you learn things like taking someone down, but, but you also practice being taken down. And I never went flying onto the mat so often within the 45 minute class session. And, um, it, it's a lot of fun, but, um, but it, it is also that training the mind factor that like it teaches that resilience that whenever I fall over to get back up. Mm. Yeah. Those are powerful lessons. And are those present in the characters you write as well? Yeah. So, um, so my main male character, um, he has um, PTSD, as I mentioned before, and he goes through a journey to, to what might help him. So at first he went through um, something a bit more reckless, like um, illegal boxing matches. And my friend um, that served in the army said sometimes um, – soldiers when they come back from the war they might do reckless things when they get back and so he liked to feel that physical um push for himself and he was experiencing those symptoms like getting startled if he hears like a back a car backfiring and um but he, he goes through a few things and um at the end he decides to try out cognitive behavior therapy and counseling um he always brushed it off beforehand saying you won't do anything and I think that's what a lot of men would think but you won't know if it's for you until you try it and for him for this character he, he finds that it is 
that first positive step for him to moving forward. One of the things I appreciate most about books that are well-written and especially series when you really get to spend time with a character over, over time, the authors that take time and intent to develop those character arcs, to pay attention to the little nuances that really bring out those, those traits. That's an art and I admire that in people. Thank you. Have you written that beforehand? Not fiction. Uh, my books yes. are nonfiction, but I do love to get lost in fiction, especially yes. when the characters are very well written. Yeah, it is a different ball game, um, fiction and nonfiction. But I guess with writing, um, it is like getting immersed yourself in that work and um, and honing that craft. Yeah, how has this process helped you to heal? I mean, you've mentioned some of the obvious ways, but have you learned different nuances about yourself in this pursuit? Yeah. Um. So with writing books, um, I do have an anxious personality, and um, and a lot of authors say don't read your book reviews, but I can't help it. I read every single one of them, and um, and sometimes like when I read a really negative review at the beginning, it did, um. It, it did bring down my mood a little bit, but, um, and I think that sort of thing still does like, um, like, um, I think with being an author, like part of doing that um, is doing media type interviews and, um, so whether radio or TV or, or anything like that. And I've had to develop a thicker skin for something like that because sometimes, um, when I see comments for some of my interviews, say if it was like. Um, one where it shows my face. I, I read some comments where people are actually critiquing what I look like. And I didn't think that, like, I didn't actually think that would happen at the beginning. Like, um, because like I was thinking these people don't know me. So why would they bother to take the time to write a comment on something they don't like about my appearance physically? But, um, and those words would repeat in circles in my head until I learned to let it go. That is just bizarre to me. What does your physical appearance have to do with your writing and your characters and the development? <laughs> yeah, I know. But like, I think if you, if I'm going to put myself out there, um, and I think authors in a way it's different compared to other people in the creative industry because you don't have to show your face as often. So you can be a bit more anonymous in that way. So it's not like an actor or singer or anything like that. Um, yeah, with being an author, it should be um, what the books say, which uh, which happens with a lot of authors um, about that quality of work. But I guess like the same thing could be said about actors or singers, like um, it should be about their songs or their music or their movies, but people do critique their appearances. And um, yeah, I think as an author, because a lot of it, a lot of authors I know, um, they're quite introverted. And they, and authors are known as more behind the scenes type um, role. I, I wasn't expecting that little critique when I do interviews. Now, when one thinks about writing a book, one might think that the actual writing of the book is the work, but yeah. that's not always the case, right? What well, was the yes. big surprise to you when you began your author journey? Um. Well. When I began, um, so I was working full time at a big four bank in a risk and compliance area. So it was very dry type work. And um, my, I started it because my mum recommended that I do a creative writing course that it's, it was a short course that happened outside of work hours. And so, so I really loved that course and connecting with like-minded people and going into that um, I was thinking that getting a book publishing deal was near impossible, that it was equivalent to being an actor or, or singer or, or something like that. And, and I, I thought it was virtually impossible for something like that to happen to me. But then um, through meeting my writing teachers, um, I learned that just through a lot of persistence, because most teachers have said persistence is the most important thing and to not take rejections to heart and to just keep going, that 
most people that they know, if they keep persisting, they'll eventually get there. And um, so that's one big thing that I learned. Um, before I did these courses, I thought that um, the publisher or um, someone else will help you do the marketing. But um, but since getting into it, I, I, I realized that authors are expected to do a lot of their own marketing and find their own um, media. So that's something I've had to learn as well, to be able to put myself out there, to be able to pitch myself that elevator pitch, which I was never good at beforehand. Um, and I'm probably still a terrible public speaker, but it's, yeah, it, it's all, all been a learning curve. Yeah, you would think you write a book and it goes on the shelf and then people come and buy it. But there's a lot that happens between writing the book and all the people coming to buy it. Yeah. And even with publicity stuff, um, publicity, so um, PR, I, I've been lucky to get some good PR, but I've learned that that's not necessarily equal to sales. Um, PR is more about getting my author brand out there and um, yeah, and, and to get my, myself a bit more known. So it doesn't necessarily equal to sales. So sometimes if you see authors like that's getting on everything, like every big national TV interview, it doesn't necessarily mean their books are selling. selling. And so, yeah, that, that's another thing that I learned. So can you give us your elevator pitch? Nothing like putting you on the spot, but okay. here's the platform and tell us why we should buy your books. Um, well, I can't, well, a quick elevator speech that's sort of gone out the window for me at the moment, but why people should buy my books is that it's got financial suspense in my books. Um, that's from me working at a big four bank, but it's not only that, um, I think it's got a lot of humor in it. Um, life can be a lot stranger than fiction. So sometimes okay. I use my real life experiences of strange things that's happened into my books. Like, for example, my novel Etched in Stone, um, the main male, the main female character, Vanessa, she gets into a car accident because she's looking at a billboard of food. And I actually did that. I, I hit the car in front of me because I got distracted with the restaurant billboard and um and because when I hit the front car um that person couldn't drive anymore so um so I called the police for traffic control and I wrote this into my book and as soon as the police came to the scene um he gave me a fine for restless driving reckless driving and so I pretty much called the police on myself and that's like that's what happened in my book well, I can totally identify that with that of um, seeing a billboard for delicious food and getting distracted in the moment. Who can't identify with that, right? Yes, I know. And the police officer just told me, your I should be on the road at all times. That's not an excuse. So I actually <laughs> told him what happened, saying, oh, I was just looking over this. I think I was too honest. That is funny. That is yeah. funny, but you know, good for you for taking responsibility. Some people would have driven on and it's good on you for, for being responsible for yourself. That's great. Yes, that's true. But he did give me two fines as soon as he saw me. <laughs> okay. So the real question, are your books yeah. sexy? That they are. So, um, there's a lot of, um, intimate, sexy scenes. Um, each book has a different type. Um, sexual type experience. So in Law and Disorder, it's a, it's more of a novella. So women can read it maybe on their lunch break or on their way to work. And that uses prop around the house, like to heighten the emotions and the intensity. So I like using, like, um, using things like sounds, like the, um, kettle boiling. So that sort of like, a metaphor in itself to like reach that peak um and with my book etched in stone they have that um interest of having sex in public places just for that thrill of getting caught and I think a lot of people do have that fantasy and in stepping stone so the main female character Jenna she's always had um desires for 
liked BDSM. And I think with romance books, um, it's important to showcase that everyone does have certain thoughts or um, desires, but to not be embarrassed or ashamed of it, just as long as you discuss it in an open and respectful way to your partner or whoever you're with. Um, yeah, it, it, it shouldn't be seen as taboo. You said something very compelling to me yesterday when we spoke. You said that anything less than an enthusiastic yes <laughs> is a no. And I love that message. That message needs to be out there. So say that again and give us some more context about that, if you yeah. would. So in a lot of romance books, Unless it's an enthusiastic 100% yes, it's a no. And that's something that's transferable to real life. Like um, you see on the news that um, that maybe whoever um, is pursuing, um, they're like quite persistent with pursuing that person. And even if the person eventually gives in, um, it could be because they felt so much pressure into the events leading up to it, they felt that they had to do it. So in a way, that sort of coercive control to be able to, well, it's kind of equivalent to like a shopkeeper following you around the shop, bugging you to buy something um, and nonstop bugging you. And then when you eventually give in and buy it, you might feel that funny feeling that you don't necessarily want this, but you just got so much pressure into that. So it, it's like that same thing that it has to be that enthusiastic yes. And I think that's what readers want to see as well to, um, to have that, even though there is that fantasy element in romance books, but to be able to see that both parties are full heartedly into that moment, whether verbally or, um, or, or through their actions to, to, so that this is what enthusiasm looks like. You don't need to pressure or, or, um, or I guess try to put manipulation onto them. So that that's something that's important in a lot of romance books to make sure that consent is there. And most most romance books does have that responsibility in making sure that the protection is there as well, like with condoms and um, just so that when people read it, they don't have a funny feeling or think that's cool to read to um, if something like that happened. And thank you for doing that. That's an important nuance. It's missing in a lot of places in our culture today. And I love yeah. that it's, it's just a part of what you do and how you write. It's an important message to get out there. Yeah. Um, and I, that's important in the dating world. So um, dating is it's always constantly changing. Um, so like with Tinder and different dating apps. Like, um, so I've been married for... Uh, well, I've been with the same person for about 11 years, but it I, those dating apps, it was never around when I was single or, or anything like that. And, um, and my husband, he's always been very respectful and very encouraging to everything that I do. And um, I, I actually used to work with my husband at the Big Four Bank. So we used to work together. And that's part of the reason why I decided to write office romances, um, because a lot of I think as much as 35% of people meet their partners at work because you spend so much time with that person. And, um, and for my book, Etched in Stone, my husband actually came up with that initial concept because when I first started writing, I wanted to get into children's or young adult books. And um, he said an idea as a joke for Etched in Stone that how about a woman accidentally walks into a man's change room and she walks into a drop dead, gorgeous, naked man, and he happens to be her future boss. And that sort of stuff, <laughs> it never happens in real life. If you're going to walk in on someone, that will be the opposite of like a brooding, hot CEO. Um, and, and I thought this idea could work and I just went with it. It sounds fun. It sounds good. Yeah. Uh, as we draw to a close today, are there any last thoughts, anything you want to share with the audience before we leave? I do want to point out anyone listening that the link to these books, the link is in the show notes. So make sure you click on it, check it out. They're going to be a lot of fun to read. And if you just need a little bit of time away from the reality of things, these books are fantastic to just enjoy some time apart. Yeah. 
Um, I guess any last words is just find something that most works for you. If you, you're experiencing mental health challenges, there's different things that you could do. If one thing doesn't work or like really make much of an impact for you, there's always other things that you could do. So I've, I've, um, I've tried a lot of things with mental health challenges from um, medication to therapy. Um, and I, I thought like, maybe I'm just stuck with this, but like, there's always something that you could do to like find something that could improve the symptoms or to change your mindset. Thank you for that message. Also a good message that we all need. Thanks for talking to us today and good luck to you in the future. I hope you sell millions of copies. Oh, thank you so much for having me.